uh, find in your Bibles the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. Psalms chapter 37. We'll be reading a verse from there in just a few minutes. Psalm 37. I've been asked several times today, uh, did you stay up and watch the ball drop New Year's Eve? And the answer is no, I did not. That is correct. I didn't. Um, how many of you did? You, 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 oh, good job. Good job. Way to go, guys. How was it for you? Right? Right? Good. Bill Vaughn, an author, said on one occasion, an optimist stays up till midnight to see the new year in. A pessimist stays up to make sure the old year leaves. Uh, it seems like at the beginning of a year we're always caught up in resolutions of one kind or another and often for many it always has to do with losing weight. And there was a wife who came into the bathroom on New Year's morning to see her husband on the scale with his stomach sucked way in. She told him that sucking your stomach in won't make you weigh less. He said, no, he knew that, but if he didn't do it, he couldn't read the numbers. <laughs> we often make resolutions like, I'm going to quit this, I'm going to start this, I want to start saying that. But resolutions, I don't know if you've noticed, usually have a rather short shelf life. Usually by February, we have forgotten the resolution. It's what reminded me of this story. A little boy asked his dad one New Year's what his resolution was going to be. And his dad said, it's going to do everything possible this year to make your mother very happy. The little boy then ran to his mom and asked her what her resolution was. And she said, to make sure that your father keeps his resolution. <laughs> so we have a tendency not to. This really is not a New Year's resolution sermon. We want to look at a concept that David talked about thousands of years ago and what was good for him then, I think would be very good for us today. Psalm 37 is a wonderful psalm. It gets overshadowed in popularity by the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. It gets overshadowed by the 100th Psalm. All right, uh, which is a psalm of rejoicing and gladness, gets overshadowed by the 119th psalm simply because that's the biggest chapter in the Bible. But Psalm 37 is a very, very good chapter. When you read the 37th psalm, you understand why his son David may have become the wisest man in the world. He learned it from his father. And he put into practice uh, in a lot of his Proverbs and the writings of Ecclesiastes the principles that David talks about in the 37th Psalm. But we're not going to tear apart and dive into the whole chapter of Psalm 37. I want to take just one snippet for today. And it's verse 4. And David said, Take delight in the Lord. And he, referring to the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. New Year's resolutions are really nothing more than desires. So the question I have for you today is what are the desires of your heart? Not the resolutions, but what are the desires of your heart? We all have a variety of desires and some of them are very similar. We, we desire to be thinner. We desire to be healthier. We desire to be secure. That's probably really not a word. It would be more secure, but let's be secure financially, relationally, positionally. We want to be nicer. We want to be kinder. We want to be more mature. We all have lots of desires, and you could probably add to that list a hundred different things. So I have a variety of questions for you on this first Sunday of 2020. And the first one is this, what drives your desires? What is the driving force behind the things that you desire in life? I came across an illustration in preparing for one of the memorial services this week that has been dogging my thoughts. And it hits at the very heart of a desire-driven life life. 
Um, as most of you know, till two years ago, uh, I was a country boy, lived out in the country. And um, we have a lot of birds in the country. All kinds of birds come flying in and out of our neighborhood. Uh, probably the two extreme birds. One, we had buzzards, vultures. It wouldn't be unusual to be in the back pasture and look up and see one and look up 10 minutes later and there's three or four and look up a minute later and there's seven or eight and you know that the scouting team has done a good job and there's about ready to be a meal. At the same time, uh, off and on, living in the country, I had a um, hummingbird feeder. How, how many of you have hummingbird feeders on your patio? Yeah, interesting little bird, aren't they? And uh, boy, big difference between hummingbirds and vultures. What I got caught off guard this week was a story about vultures and hummingbirds. I, yes, they were, you know, in the vicinity where I live, but I never thought about both of those birds also living in the desert. I was born in the desert. I was born in Blythe, California. If you know that, my dad started a church. I mean, some people say, wow, I've never known anybody born in Blythe. Uh, why would anybody want to go there? It's a question I asked my dad. Why would you want to start a church in Blythe? I am convinced my dad in those days loved preaching on hell, and this was right next door, all right? <laughs> <clears throat> But, but I drive through the desert two or three, four times a year, go into Oklahoma. We go right through the heart of the Mojave Desert. I got to be honest, you don't see much wildlife when you go through Mojave Desert. It's almost like nothing lives there. And yet, there are vultures, buzzards. And I found out this week, there are hummingbirds. Two very interesting birds with two different appetites. Vultures. They seek rotting meat. This is what they look for. This is what they live off of. They thrive on that diet. But hummingbirds also live in the desert, and they ignore the smelly flesh of dead animals. Instead, they look for beautiful, colorful blossoms of desert plants. The vultures, they live off of what was. They live off of the past. They fill themselves with what is dead and gone. But hummingbirds, they live on what is. They seek new life. They choose to fill themselves with freshness and life. And there's a point for us in the different appetites of a buzzard and a hummingbird. And the point is this. Each of those two creatures find exactly what they're looking for. And so do we. So what do we look for? Are we more like a vulture and we live off of the past? The things that have been? The things that were? Or do we look for the freshness? I, I love the video that Milo chose for today during Offertory. Lamentations 3. The Lord's mercies are new, fresh, every morning. So what are we living off of? What is it that you and I are looking for? What do we desire? And why do I desire the things that I desire? What is it that fuels my appetite? Uh, is it my emotions? Do, do, do I... Do I simply want the things I want because I'm emotionally driven? Uh, think about it for a moment. Have any of you ever eaten things because of emotion? <laughs> I'm, I'm taking from that yes. Okay? Sometimes we can be emotionally driven. I, 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 I'm trying to change one thing. I'm trying to eat only when I'm hungry. See, I grew up in a culture where you ate three times a day and then you always had a bowl of ice cream before you went to bed. <laughs> I mean, it, was, it was routine. I'm also one of those that if I liked the taste of something, I would keep eating it after I was already satisfied just because it tastes good. 
so I would keep eating. I would say that's kind of emotion-driven eating, wouldn't you? Um, any of you shop emotionally? I'm going to take that as a yes. Okay? There are going to be several husbands who are going to have a stiff neck when they leave here today because you snapped your head over to your wife as soon as I said that. But, but what is it that drives our desires? Emotion? Is it image? I, I want people to have this view of me, so this is what I want because I want people to think of me in a particular way? Or is it truth which drives your desires? Something to think about. Um, this whole hummingbird thing, after I read this one story, is a fixation for me this week. I, I remembered as I was thinking about that hummingbird story that it was just a couple of months ago, I had one of the surprises in my life. Um, I, I have been fairly close to hummingbirds at my house because we had a feeder, but it was always the, the window in between us. So I've, I've seen them about three feet away. But, but in our backyard, and we don't have a feeder in our backyard right now, but I was back there doing something, uh, and, and, and I heard this little noise, and I turned around, and there was a hummingbird right there. I mean, I never had one get that close to me. I mean, it was right there, and I heard him before I saw him. And I was mystified. I was, I was so shocked by it and so stunned and so surprised. Man, I, all I could do was, was count how many times that his, his, his wings beat per second. Do you know, 25 times a second. He, he beat those wings 1,500 times in just a minute. Do you all believe I counted those? Good, because I didn't. I looked it up because I couldn't count that fast, and so I looked it up. And they can beat their wings up to 25 times per second, 1,500 times per minute. And do you know that a hummingbird is the only bird that can fly backwards? Being confronted with this amazing bit of God's creation, I'm reminded of Another psalm that David wrote, the 71st psalm, in verse, verse 19, he says, Oh God, you have done great things. A hummingbird that can fly backwards, beat its wings 25 times a second. Who, oh God, is like you? When's the last time... You stood, sat, laid down, walked, and were in awe of something about who God is. When's the last time you had a ah ah moment with God? See, the scripture says that if the people of God refuse to talk about the person of God, then God will find some way for the trees and the rocks to cry out and let folks know there is a God. A hummingbird right here reminded me, oh God, who else is like you? You see, sometimes we spend too much time having aha moments in front of the mirror, getting our hair just right and our beard trimmed just so-so and putting on our best suits and we stand in awe of what we see and we forget to stand in awe of who God is. You didn't know hummingbirds could be so informative, did you? Oh, I'm not finished. Because of this hummingbird interest this past week, I googled information about hummingbirds. I came across an article written by a gentleman by the name of Brian Doyle where he talks a lot about hummingbirds. He said, I don't know if you know this or not, but hummingbirds have a race car heart. There you go, Steve. Race car heart. They eat oxygen at eye-popping rate. 
Their hearts are built of thinner, leaner fibers than ours. Their arteries are stiffer and more taut. Their hearts are stripped to the skin for the war against gravity and inertia, the mad search for food, the insane idea of flight. They are tiny little birds and their heart beats between 10 to 25 times a second. So even if you put your big ear right next to the tiny chest of a hummingbird, it would be very hard to discern their heartbeat because it beats so fast it sounds just like one beat. The price of their ambition is a life lived always close to death. The hummingbird suffers more heart attacks, aneurysms, and ruptures than any other living creature on earth. It's costly to fly like that. I might suggest to you, it's costly to live like that. You burn out, you fry the machine, you melt the engine. Now contrast that with the biggest heart in the world. It's in the blue whale. It weighs more than seven tons. It's as big as a room. It's a room that has four chambers in it. A child could walk around in the heart of a blue whale, head high, bending only to stoop through the valves. And the valves are as big as the swinging doors of a saloon. The house of a heart drives a creature that is one hundred feet long. That's how long this building is from front door to back wall. Wow. Every creature on earth has approximately two billion heartbeats to spend in a lifetime. You can spend them slowly like a tortoise and live for 200 years. Some of y'all need to slow down just a little bit. Or you can spend them like a hummingbird and their life expectancy is about two years. That prompts another question. What kind of heart do you have? Is it beating to the rhythms of the song of praise to God? Does your heart beat to the rhythm of eternity? Or is your pulse set to the movement of the city life, to the job that you work in, to the possessions and the properties that you want to own? Is your heart more attuned to the pulse of heaven or the pulse of hell? What kind of heart do you have? You want another hummingbird question? I got one for you. When I was in Bible college, one of the first books I ever read by J. Adams was uh, a book on Christian psychology, how to do pastoral counseling. J. Adams writes in another one of his books that under the roof in his backyard hangs a hummingbird feeder and he keeps it filled with sugar water. He said there are four openings in that feeder from which four hummingbirds may suck the nectar. Yet day after day, from early morning until after dusk, the feeder is the source of a bird war. One bird chases all the other hummingbirds away. Now after the last service, Fred came up to me and he said, Tim, I know just what you're talking about. He said, in fact, I went and bought a BB gun because I was going to shoot the bully hummingbird in my back patio. He chased all the other ones away. And he said, and then I felt guilty about wanting to shoot the thing, and so I took the BB gun back. I said, you should have called me. So, <laughs> but you guys have seen bully hummingbirds? I, I never have. I never have. But Fred verifies this is true, just as J. Adam tells the story in his book. Adams continues to write, as I said, there's room for four birds at the feeder. And fully that number attempt to feed there every day. But this stronger one, the bully, the one who owns the feeder, will not let them. All day long he sits on a branch of a nearby tree guarding his feeder and defying others to transgress on what he has established is his territory. Sounds a little bit like some folks in church and their seat in a pew. (laughs) 
Sorry, folks, couldn't resist that one. All right. If you're new here, it's just a little reminder to our church, folks, nobody owns a pew. If anybody tells you you can't sit somewhere, you tell them the pastor said, yes, you can. All right. Adams continues to write, this ongoing slice of life confronts us throughout the day as the war rages on. The hummers streak across the yard, the keen hummer in hot pursuit of the intruder, and while the chase is on, others sneak in for a sip or two, only to be driven off when he returns. This is the lesson he said we learn. I bought the feeder. I supply the sugar water. The birds don't earn it. They receive it all by grace, yet day after day, they fight over who gets to enjoy it. And then he makes this application, oh, how like many people of God, hummingbirds are. All we have or are that is worthwhile is a gift of God's pure grace. And yet, if we're not careful, we become proud, self-centered, envious, and quarrelsome. Often we fight over God's good gifts rather than expressing our gratitude and humility and sharing what we have been given with others. Just as I am confronted daily with the rivalry in my yard, even so God is confronted daily with the rivalry in his. That prompts a question. Am I living my life in the grip of God's grace? Or am I living it in the vice of my gripes? Remember what David said? Take delight in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. So, what drives your desires? Where do your desires come from? Emotion, taste, image, truth. When's the last time you marveled at the greatness of who God is? What kind of heart do you have? Is it beating to the rhythm of the life of Christ? Or to the beatings of this world? And how are you living out that life? With grace or with gripes? I don't know if you noticed in that one verse, before the promise is made, the promise is God will give us the desires of our heart. Before the promise, there's an imperative. Did you notice it? Take delight in the Lord. That's what should drive our desires. Take delight in the Lord. If we don't take delight in him, he is not obligated to keep his promise. The promise has a prerequisite. Delight in the Lord. And then the Lord will give us the desires of our heart. So, so how do we learn to do this? That's another whole sermon or sermon series. But let me highlight just a couple of things. Number one, you got to get to know him better. Did you ever date somebody who had different interests than you did? You probably married them. <laughs> and did you discover that those interests that you were interested in before all of a sudden have now become interesting to you? As you got to know them. Now, I haven't taken up knitting yet. Okay. Now, Shelly doesn't knit. Do you? Okay. <laughs> Making sure I got that one right. But we got to get to know him better. Delight in him. He will give you the desires of our heart. We have to get to know him better. How do we do that? This is not rocket science. Brings us to point two. You need to spend time with him. Choose to spend time. If all you choose is Sunday morning, you ain't getting enough. If all you got in a conversation with your spouse was 30 minutes a week, would that be enough? I know some of you ladies are saying, I wished I got that much. Yeah. <laughs> 
I knew you wives were thinking it, so I figured I'd better say it, all right? But man, if it's just 30 minutes, it's not enough in any relationship. It's got to be daily. Daily, we've got to spend time. We've got to be in this book. And some of you are saying, Tim, I don't understand much of what I read here. Okay, then here's what I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, an assignment. If that's your excuse for not reading the Bible every day, go to Majesty Christian Bookstore and buy a daily devotional. Start right there. My utmost for his highest, Jesus calling, streams in the desert, God's best for my life. Pick one of those. Those, those are four of the best ones you can find. Hey, And start there. It'll give you a scripture verse. It'll give you a little application. And it may even help you with a prayer at the bottom of the one page. And they're small pages. Hey, you can get big print. They're still small pages. Not very big. Start right there. But do that every day. Until you learn that you can hear the voice of God as you read the scripture for yourself. Okay? But start right there and do it every day. Every single day. Get to know him better. Spend more time with him. Learn, learn what it is to have a running conversation with God. We often think that prayer are those moments when we pause, bow our head, close our eyes, fold our hands, and begin with, Dear Father, that is prayer, but that's not all that prayer is. Prayer is when you're behind the wheel of your car and you're driving down the road and all of a sudden somebody comes to your attention you haven't thought about in a long time and you say, oh God, I don't know what's going on in their world. I don't know why you brought them to my attention, but is there something I need to listen to? Is there a call I need to make? Is there a visit I need to, to stop and have? Have a running conversation. Eyes don't have to be closed. It doesn't have to start with dear God and it doesn't have to end with Amen. It could be an ongoing conversation. As you're reading the scripture, God, I don't have a clue what you mean by that. Somebody who's sick, God, you know what their needs are. How do you want to use me? Ongoing conversation. Last thing I want to say this morning is we need to learn to trust him more. You never get too mature for what you need to learn more trust. Full surrender, full trust. We need to do that more often. God doesn't want to be a Santa Claus God. Just a God that we call on for good times or good things. He wants to be an ever-present source of help and strength every moment of every day in our life. It's called complete dependence upon him. Trusting him. Not allowing the circumstances to dictate our emotions, but allowing our trust in him to control our emotions. Greater sense of trust. The God who created a hummingbird and the God who created a blue whale wants to be the God of your life. And he wants to be the one who shapes the desires of your heart. While I was praying the closing prayer, 8 o'clock service, I got stuck for a moment. I got stuck thinking about do the desires control my heart or does my heart control my desires? If, if, if we work it from desires to our heart, I wonder how healthy our heart will be. Because that's outward circumstances controlling the heart. I don't know if you ever noticed, but outward stimulation can make your pulse go up. And that's not always best for us. Paul wrote in Philippians, let this mind be in you. It's another word that also can be translated heart when it's connected to who God is. The scripture also says, and Paul wrote, he says that when we become a Christian, God takes the stony, hard heart out of us and he replaces it with a soft, supple, fleshy heart. One that he would love to mold and shape. 
So I guess the question I want to leave you with is this. Is your heart moldable? Are the desires of your heart moldable? And if you had to walk out of here today, would you say that you're a hummingbird or a vulture? I think a vulture snuck in the back door. A vulture lives out of the past and lives off garbage. A hummingbird finds that which is new every single day. What are you going to be? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we don't need more resolutions. What we need is to understand the desires of our heart. We need to understand what is influencing those desires that we have. Do I want more stuff, more things, more popularity? Or do I want more of you? Stuff, things, and popularity become carnage for vultures. When I want more of you, I find the freshness for living life every day in spite of the circumstances around me. Father, I trust this year we'll grow in our knowledge of who you are. We'll grow in our desire to spend more time with you and we'll grow in our ability to trust you with everything in our life. But Father, we need to start. And I believe this is as good a day as any to start. And it will start with a choice that we make by the influence of Scripture in our minds. And I trust God that we will follow the great wisdom of David when he says, take delight in the Lord. Choose to delight in the Lord. And if we take that initiative, then you'll take over and you will provide for us the desires of our heart. We commit all this to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Do not think that this is a new pattern for 2020 <laughs> just because you're getting out 12 minutes early. <laughs>